Let me first of all apologize for my somewhat prehistoric handout. I've noticed no PowerPoint. So you won't have any pictures or any wonderful pronunciation, con intonation, contours or anything. I won't be doing this and things lighting up. None of that at all, just me talking, I'm afraid. <laughs> Second thing, probably more important, I just want to let you know, is, is sort of a, a bit of a confession. Um, which is that this is a course on phonetics, and this is a lecture about intonation. But I neither really research into phonetics or intonation. My work is concerned with the analysis of meaning, and pragmatics in particular. It just so happens, though, that the kind of work that I do has led me to look at how behaviours such as intonation, facial expression, gesture, etc., how they help speakers convey meaning, and how they also help hearers interpret meaning. So, this is a bit of a change from the usual lecture in this course on discourse intonation or intonation and meaning, because I'm focusing very much on things from the meaning end rather than from the intonation end, although, of course, intonation is very important in this. It's a particularly important thing to me because so many students come up to you as a teacher here year after year and say, hey, what does this intonation contour mean? And, of course, you can say all kinds of things. You know, you can think on your feet and say, oh, well, it means you're detached, or it means you're happy, or it means etc., etc. But, of course, what it really means is going to depend pretty much on the words that it accompanies. Okay? So that's the kind of view that I'm going to be taking. Its intonation is very important, but we need to always bear in mind that it's the words that are carrying the main meaning. So let me just, uh, what, what I'll do with the handout is hopefully follow it, but I'm kind of notorious for shooting off at a tangent. And if I really shoot off too far, then um, stick your hand up and say, Tim, back to the handout, please, or back to the lecture. The way we say the words that we say unquestionably helps us convey the meanings that we want to convey. There's no argument about that. The rises and falls and the dips and the quality of our voice all help us convey meaning, and in some cases, they change the meaning that we convey. Sometimes, unintentionally, we betray what we really feel by our behaviours. So there are a few examples um, on the handout. Number one, Peter, in a sad tone of voice, says, I can't come to the party. <laughs> Peter is saying, I can't come to the party. He's conveying something like, I'm sad that I can't come to the party. So he's conveying his attitude. In two, we've got two uh, a, a pair of sentences. The first one, Peter insulted John, and then Mary insulted him. In the second, Peter insulted John, and then Mary insulted him. What the intonation or what the stresses do here is change the focus somewhat. And in most contexts, the first one of those would be that Mary insulted John, and in the second one, it would be Mary insulted Peter and that's done with the focus of the voice. Three, here's a reply that I've heard many times. Somebody, be it a tutor or another student on the course, says, are you enjoying the skin? And the student replies, yes, with a high four, all enthusiastic and happy to be here. <coughs> Sometimes if you see people out in the rain in Gordon Square, they say something more like, are you enjoying the Yes. <laughs> problem, maybe the course was a problem, maybe the weather, but it's not the same as the yes accompanied with an I fall. And finally, in, this, in the example, lexical stress, of course, changes the meanings of the words that we convey completely. So there's a difference between permit, which is the noun, and permit, which is the verb. Likewise, record and record. And in those few examples, and there are many, many more, what you're essentially seeing is the different functions of intonation that Patricia talked about in her lecture yesterday. And she calls them the grammatical function, the focusing function, which is sometimes called the accentual function, and also the attitudinal function. So those are three things that Patricia talked about yesterday. The thing is that describing the functions of intonation is not necessarily to say how it works. There are all kinds of different questions you can raise. It does carry meaning, but of course the meaning is not independent of the words 
themselves. So here are a few questions that I sort of pose. This is kind of two thirds of the way down the handout, first page. Does intonation encode linguistic meaning? Some people assume that, you know, if, if, you don't, if you're not sort of a particular student of linguistics, you might just assume that all intonation is linguistic. Maybe it isn't, maybe it's something else. Does it encode non-linguistic meaning? By that I mean, does it encode anything? Is it just some sort of more natural kind of device, a bit like pointing? And if not, if it's not linguistic, if it doesn't encode linguistic, then how, does, how on earth does it work? And these are questions that people who look at things from more the meaning kind of end, which is what I do, are interested in looking at. So what I want to do today and tomorrow is consider a few theoretical questions. The first question, which is question A on your handout, is do all elements of intonation work in the same way? The second one B, how can we best describe and explain the meaning conveyed by intonation? And the third one, which is a less theoretical question really, which is can we make generalizations and are these generalizations useful for teachers or learners of English or English phonetics or pronunciation? Now, what I'm going to do today is focus primarily on questions A and B. So today's lecture is going to be pretty theoretical. The lecture tomorrow will look at question C, and we're going to look more at the kind of uh, some more practical intonation contours in social rituals and stuff like that. So today's going to be pretty theoretical, tomorrow's going to be less so. Okay, so we're on to the second um, page of the handout, which is this side here. My work in pragmatics um, involves all sorts of what I find interesting questions, but one of the central questions that anybody looking at pragmatics is concerned with is, what does it mean to say that something means something? What is meaning? It's a word we use and we bandy around a lot, and you hear it in phonetics and intonation classes, but what does it actually mean? Well, there are several distinctions that some of you, if you've studied linguistic, might have, ling linguistics, might have heard of, or you may, may not have done. And I just want to introduce you to a few of those distinctions, and they can be a kind of backdrop, if you like, to the kind of discussion where I'm going to some of the points I'm going to talk about today. The first uh, distinction that philosophers make in meaning is a distinction between conventional or linguistic or sometimes non-natural meaning. This is the kind of meaning where we say a word means something. And if you, in your language, you know, if I say to you, rain means, then you substitute the word in your language. So if you're French, rain means pleu, or pleu means rain, or something, or pluie is it, maybe. Um, and you can contrast that with what philosophers and pragmatists call natural meaning. This is a kind of inherent indicator meaning that is, in, that is a property of some things. So it's something more like those black clouds mean rain, or those spots mean measles. It's a totally different kind of meaning to the kind of meaning inherent in language. It's more like saying something is a consequence of something than just saying a word means something. So that's the first distinction that we need to think about. The second one, which is equally important, or perhaps even more important, is a distinction that semanticists and pragmatists make between sentences and utterances. Okay, and this is absolutely crucial. So there are a few examples here that are going to illustrate, I hope, the point I'm trying to make. Um, in seven, Jack says to Lily, would you like something to eat? And Lily responds, I've just had lunch. In eight, Jack says to Lily, would you like a cup of coffee? Lily replies, coffee would keep me awake. And in nine, Jack says to Lily, have you read Tim Wharton's latest paper on meaning? And Lily replies, I don't read rubbish. <laughs> we will be, I will analyze that one in some depth and see what you think that Lily means by that. So we need to draw a distinction between what sentences mean and what speakers mean when they utter those sentences. And I think you'll all see that in those examples, what the speaker means, or that the message the speaker is trying to convey, 
is something, some distance from what the words actually mean. So let's look at um, 10. This is the sentence that Lily replies to Jack when Jack says, would you like something to eat? She says, I've just had lunch. Okay, the sentence meaning, I've just had lunch, is exactly that, I've just had lunch. You could translate that into all of your, into the, the native language that you speak. But what does Lily mean when she says, I've just had lunch? Thank you. Yeah. I'm not hungry, or no, I don't want something to eat. She's saying no, and she's giving a reason. In 12, Lily says, coffee would keep me awake. And that's her response to Jack's question, would you like a cup of coffee? Coffee would keep me awake is a sentence that has a meaning in its own linguistic meaning. But what does Lily mean to communicate there? Yes, please. Yes? Please. She doesn't want coffee. Actually, it depends entirely on the context. If, if Lily needs a good night's sleep, then probably that reply would mean, no, I don't want a cup of coffee. If she was, re if she was studying for an exam that was uh, early in the morning and she needed to keep revising, then it would mean, yes. Let's look at nine and be very careful. Have you read Tim Watt's latest paper on meaning? Lily replies, I don't read rubbish. What is she implying? She's stupid. Bearing in mind I have complete control over whether you've got a certificate for this. <laughs> what do you think? She doesn't know anything. She hasn't read it is one possible interpretation. <laughs> Another interpretation, which is of course the interpretation you all went for, is that of course she's read it. Because she doesn't read rubbish. Ah. Yeah, you see? <laughs> Strange how nobody went to that interpretation. Oh. <laughs> I won't forget. So the thing is, there's a distinction between sentences, which are abstract things that have properties in a particular language, and utterances, which are not abstract things. They are concrete. They are real. They are out there in the world. And what an utterance means is a property of the intention of the speaker who utters it. And broadly speaking, what I've tried to do in the space of about three minutes is introduce you to the distinction between semantics and pragmatics. Semantics is the study of sentences, what sentences mean. Pragmatics, is, which is what I do, is the study of what utterances mean. And Sentence meaning and utterance meaning are also sometimes talked about as linguistic meaning and speaker meaning. And they are, as you can see on the handout, the respective domains of semantics and pragmatics. So, the first question, um, question A, was do all elements of intonation work in the same way? And this is the question we're going to turn, uh, look at, turn to now. Rather. So, what sort of information does intonation convey? Well, Lots of people have written about this over the years, and one of the things that lots of people have claimed is that actually intonation, in fact prosody generally, communicates meaning along the whole range of ways, from at one end natural meaning, to sort of more pragmatic meaning, to semantic meaning. And some fairly you know, heavyweight researchers have talked about this, and this is on the handout here. It's talked about ranging along a continuum from more linguistic to less linguistic, from natural to language specific. So, and if you turn over to the next page on the handout. So if you sort of say something like the example we had in one, where Peter says, oh, I can't come to the party, in a sad tone of voice, that's seen as a kind of natural phenomenon. It's a bit like natural meaning. It's a sort of natural indicator of how you feel. And of course, your sad tone of voice is going to be mirrored by probably a, a little slightly stooped posture. Mm. And your eyes might, you know, you might have tears in your eyes. <laughs> Who knows? That's the natural side. If you go all the way to the other end of the continuum, we've got these examples like we had in four. Permit, permit, record, record. Those are not natural things at all. They're arbitrary. But they're linguistic. <clears throat> and in fact, in my work on nonverbal communication generally, you find this kind of continuum all over the place. So even in a, a study of gesture, for example, you have lots of, you know, when I'm speaking now, I've got my hands doing these things, and I'm really not thinking about it at all. Okay, it's something that uh, we do. But of course, there are other gestures, 
gestures, for example, that you only see in your own country or in England, and I won't perform those gestures now, but you know exactly what I'm talking about, which are culture-specific. They're not natural at all. A certain gesture means a certain thing. Okay? You're not really watching me talk and thinking, what does he mean by this? But if I got cross and made a certain gesture, you might say, what did that mean? Okay? So, I mean, the answer to the question, do all parts of intonation work in the same way, is it's got to be no, they don't. Okay? Because you've got them all across this continuum from linguistic to non-linguistic, from natural to non-natural. So we're not going to be able to provide a unified account of intonation just on the basis of the behaviours themselves, because they all work in different ways. And equally, we probably need to just bear in mind that, of course, the examples such as record and record and permit and permit and export and export, etc., etc., those things are pretty much unquestionably linguistic. And the tone of voice and the stuff that is mirrored by um, gesture, that's probably natural. But there's a whole load of other stuff that's somewhere in the middle, particularly intonation contours. And those are things we need to think about as well, because it's unclear whether they're linguistic, or I can't remember which way I did it, natural <laughs> or linguistic. That's where I needed PowerPoint, you see. So what I want to do now for the next sort of 20 minutes is just give you a really, really brief um, tour of some of the theoretical approaches to intonation. And different people have different approaches, and we'll just look very briefly at them and perhaps assess them. Then towards the end, I'd like to just introduce to you a few new ideas, which are not directly related to the study of intonation, um, but may well be applied to them in the future. And these are things that I've been working on uh, myself with a colleague at UCL as well. So the first theoretical approach to intonation is the kind of view that ultimately, somewhere, it's all natural. And the whole thing is natural in a way. So we've said, and uh, I think most people have the intuition that a sad tone of voice or an angry tone of voice is natural. But many people think, well, actually, the whole lot is natural. Um, now, the, the sort of champion of this sort of uh, approach, which is known as the iconic approach, uh, is a gent or was a gentleman called Dwight Bollinger. And, um, Bollinger writes in a very persuasive, beautiful way. Um, and I've just got a couple of quotes that illustrate this kind of view, that intonation is just natural. So Bollinger's interested, as indeed am I, in the parallels between facial expression, gesture, and intonation. And he says that the parallels are evidence that intonation, and here's the quote on your handout, is part of a gestural complex whose primitive and still surviving function is the signaling of emotions and their degrees of intensity. An R of surprise with a high fall in pitch is paralleled by a high fall on the part of the eyebrows. And if you, if during your intonation classes you watch the eyebrows of your fellow students, you'll know that that is pretty much true. In fact, I've got a few students, I don't even need to listen to tell whether they're doing a full rise. I just need to watch their eyebrows. Um, a similar coupling of pitch and head movement can be seen in the normal production of a conciliatory and acquiescent utterance, such as I will, with the accent at the lowest pitch. We call this a bow when it involves the head, but the intonation bows at the same time. And here, um, here's a much quoted uh, couple of sentences from Bollinger where he was sort of pressed on, well, look, you know, surely it's not all natural, and he conceded this. Intonation assists grammar. In some instances, it may be indispensable to it, but it is not ultimately grammatical. If here and there it has entered the realm of the arbitrary, and by arbitrary he means linguistic, it has taken the precaution of blazing a trail to back where it comes from, back to where it came from. So what he's saying is, well, all right, maybe some of it eventually gets into the language, but you just have to look at it to see that it all comes from natural meaning. So for Bollinger and people who follow his approach, 
the meaning conveyed by intonation is like natural meaning. It's more akin to something like spots mean measles, a frown means you're angry, a smile means you're sad. That intonation contour means whatever it means. So that's one view of intonation that we might take. Another view, which is um, possibly more popular, I don't know if I'm correct to say that, but I sort of get the feeling it is, is that actually intonation is linguistic. It's not natural. Maybe bits of it are natural, but most of it is linguistic. And there are a few people, Lad, Carlos Hussenhoven and Wichmann, they suggest that the fact that there is cross-linguistic variation in many intonation patterns shows that they have become grammaticalized, and that's how we need to treat them. And there are other um, linguistic accounts, and if you look at there's some references there to Paul Tench and to uh, Stephen 2000. In fact, I should mention that I've, there's quite a lengthy list of re references at the end um, of the handout. I just thought, since I'm presuming that some of you haven't particularly thought about intonation from this perspective, you might, if you're interested, follow some of this up. And I mean, lots of, lots of the sort of more traditional accounts of intonation have their roots in the view that it is linguistic or grammatical. Um, Halliday's approach, there's a quote from uh, his approach to his book in 1967, the theory of grammar should be elaborated in order to accommodate intonation. Intonation patterns can be systematized into a formal grammatical statement. That's a very different thing to saying what Bollinger is saying. Okay, over the page, our own um, O'Connor and Arnold's approach in 1973, it's not a sort of explicitly a grammatical approach, but it does make very specific, sort of almost linguistic sounding claims about meaning. So for example, this is just a, a random example, a low four means that a statement is definite and complete insofar as it is a separate item of interest. In addition, it conveys a cool, calm, phlegmatic, <coughs> detached, reserved, dispassionate, uh, dispassionate, dull, possibly grim or surly attitude on the part of the speaker. Well, that may be so, but if you say 13 with a low fall, mm -hmm. I love you, it does not sound phlegmatic, detached, reserved, dispassionate, necessarily. The point is, the meaning that you convey with a low fall is going to be dependent on your <coughs> words as well. You can't just say, this contour means this. And many of the distinctions in O'Connor and Arnold, and I'm not criticising it at all, because as a, as a framework with, with, with which to teach intonation, I find it very, very useful. They provide incredibly fine-grained distinctions between, for example, mild surprise but acceptance of the listener's premises versus critical surprise versus affronted surprise. And I have difficulty actually working out on earth what the difference between them is anyway, let alone actually listening to somebody's intonation and making that decision. The point is that the meaning that intonation conveys, no matter how you analyze it, is context dependent. Now, that to me suggests that you need at least some part, there needs to be some role played by pragmatics in an account of how intonation works. If it was context independent, if it was true to say that this intonation contour means this independent of context, then that's a semantic issue. But as soon as you say it's context dependent, you need pragmatics in there somewhere. So that brings me to the next uh, <coughs> approach. And I mean, this is basically the result of a sort of trawl through the literature for a book that I'm writing currently. I did find an interesting, what I thought was an interesting pragmatic approach from um, some people called Ward and Hirschberg, or Hirschberg and Ward, in the mid-80s, mid-90s, and only sort of five or six years ago, um, they wrote a paper about it. They say, well, look, intonation is context dependent, therefore, and here's, here's a quote, since the interpretation of such intonational variations is indeed dependent upon contextual factors, factors we will define intonation meaning as essentially pragmatic in nature. I agree completely. However, if you actually 
read the paper by Hirschberg and Ward, or Ward and Hirschberg, they say that it's a pragmatic approach, but don't provide any kind of pragmatic framework. In fact, what they argue is that certain international contours encode pragmatic meaning. Well, the point is that pragmatic meaning is not encoded, ever. If you recall our examples earlier on, 7, 8, and 9, what's encoded is the sentence meaning. The meaning that the speaker intends to convey is something that the hearer must infer. It's something you need to work out, and it depends on inferring the mental states of the person that you're talking to. So the approach, in my opinion, offered by Hirschberg and Ward is not a pragmatic one at all, even though it's dressed up in pragmatic, in pragmatic terminology. And in fact, just at the close of that section on the handout, um, again, if, if none of you have studied pragmatics, this term uh, conventional implicature might be a source of great mystery to you. But for those of you who have come across it, <coughs> they basically say that their account is pragmatic because they can deal with intonation as a kind of conventional implicature. But conventional implicature is not a pragmatic notion, it's a semantic notion. So this, to my mind at least, is a semantic account which calls itself pragmatics. So even though they motivate quite strongly a pragmatic account, they don't actually offer one. And somehow we need to find somewhere where we can begin to offer a pragmatic account. And the place I believe to at least start a pragmatic account, or to begin looking, is uh, in the work of David Brazel, who did a huge amount of work on intonation, and in particular how it relates to discourse. Brazel avoided taking a grammatical view. He said that intonation is more satisfactorily accounted for at the level of discourse than at the level of grammar. At the level of discourse, he means as as it applies to a whole text or a whole fragment of conversation. How the discourse itself is organised is very much a function of how the intonation is applied. Excuse me just one moment. <coughs> now, in the two minutes I've got to talk about David Brazel's account, I really can't do any justice at all. And it's a pretty complex account he offers using notions such as prominence, tone, key, termination. But here's one of the things that he says, and this just gives you an idea of how he views intonation working. He says, falls on the whole, a fall in an intonation contour means that you're offering new information. A rise means that the speaker is offering given information. He calls falling tones proclaiming tones, so they're the ones that offer new information, and he calls the rising tones referring tones, insofar as they refer to information already present in the discourse. The best way to illustrate this is just with um, a little example. So in 14, somebody says, what will you be doing when skep is over? Okay, skep is, the, is now the given information, so it's gonna have a rising tone. The person will answer, I'll stop thinking about phonetics when skep is over. <laughs> Okay. If we turn over, a slightly different example. Imagine somebody who just can't stop thinking about phonetics. Imagine. Will you ever stop thinking about phonetics? I'll stop thinking about phonetics when skep is over. Here, when skep is over, there is a fall. Okay? That's new. The rise is referring to existing information. Now this is a really, that's a, a tiny example of the kind of work that Brazel does, but it's a slightly different view. It sees discourse as having a slightly different, uh, intonation as having a slightly different role rather than just being strictly grammatical. Now within the department here at UCL, um, the person who, who traditionally gives this, uh, gives this in tomorrow's lecture and who very modestly doesn't refer very much to her own work, Jill House, has raised some interesting questions with David Brazel's um, work. I mean, th this idea of uh, falls just happening on new information 
and rises just happening on uh, given information is problematic in itself. And here are a couple of examples from a paper of Jill's. I told you, I don't want to go. Okay, if you've already told somebody that it's given, but it has a fall. I told you, I don't want to go. Mm -hmm. Also, if somebody um, asks you what you're doing, you know, what are you doing today? Well, this morning I'm going shopping, and this afternoon I'm finishing my paper. It's all new information, but there's a rise in there as well. So perhaps we can't be that exact. Perhaps we can't say, well, look, falls is, um, uh, all, uh, is given information and rises is new. Perhaps we can't be that precise. But this is an, a nice insight to be able to use. Another possible problem with this kind of discourse intonation or discourse analysis approach is that it's, it's very descriptive, it's not really explanatory. In fact, it sees uh, the, the object of inquiry, if you like, is the discourse itself. And in pragmatics, at least now, we're sort of, we're concerned with the discourse itself. But the discourse itself is only a property of, it's only a result of speakers. And what we're interested in pragmatics in doing is sort of modelling the performance of a speaker. So we're thinking about the mental states of the speaker, for example. And in discourse analysis, there's a much more kind of descriptive, uh, discoursey, non-cognitive view. Here's what Robert Ladd has to say about it. This is at the top of six. Uh, in a very interesting book which I'd recommend to anybody for a, a survey of all the different approaches. There's been very little real debate on this issue, i.e. on international meaning. I think this is primarily because we know too little about pragmatic inference for the debate to be conclusive. Well, what excites me and what's, what's exciting about the work that I do and some of my colleagues here at UCL do is that actually we think we know a bit about pragmatic inference now. We actually think we do know a little bit about how it works. So rather than just saying, well, we don't know anything about it, we can say a little bit about it, and we can look at cognitive models of pragmatics and see how intonation fits with those. So let me just introduce you. We're at the point now of the lecture where I'm just kind of going off a little bit and telling you about um, my work and the work of my colleagues here. Um, there aren't going to be any answers, but hopefully some of the things I say might prompt you to ask new questions or ask old questions in different ways. The first thing that we think about in cognitive pragmatics is to do with the notion of context. In discourse analysis, generally speaking, the context of discourse is the previous utterances. So it's what's given. Okay? We don't think about context in those terms in uh, sort of more recent theories of pragmatics. We, th we think about context in terms of the mental state of the person who is speaking and the mental state of the person who is listening. That will include previous discourse. It will include all sorts of things to do with physical environment. But it will in and it will include what they share. But essentially, context is a cognitive issue in modern approaches to pragmatics. And I've written on the handout there, the sort of more formal way of putting it, it is the set of assumptions, which is just thoughts, except really, brought, about, brought to bear on a given interpretation. Now, the person um, that I've worked with over the years at UCL is Deirdre Wilson, who's written a, a, a famous book on pragmatics called Relevance, Communication and Cognition. And if any of you are interested in reading a kind of a pragmatic view of how, for example, contrastive and emphatic stress might work, um, of the kind in example two on the handout, I've, ref I've referred you to a section of their book. Basically, the idea behind their view of relevance theory is that interpretation is all a matter of balancing two different cognitive, two different uh, um, states that a mind is in. It's the amount of processing that you have to do and it's the amount of effects, contextual effects or cognitive effects, that your mind can generate from a given utterance. So if the argument is that if a given stress pattern is more costly to interpret, that will take you to a slightly different effect. That's a, that's a, a very short introduction to quite a complex matter. But if, if you do take the time to go to the 
section in their book Relevance that will hopefully become clearer. Jill House, who I quoted a little bit earlier, um, she works from a relevance theory perspective as well, or has done in the past and is, is continuing to do so. Jill, this is a quote from Jill's most recent paper, all aspects of international meaning may be seen as establishing the most appropriate context for an utterance, within which that utterance may be most relevantly interpreted. So the idea is that what intonation does is it constrains the context. It sort of alters the context in which the utterance is to be taken remembering that context is a kind of cognitive issue, not just a property of discourse. And um, these, this kind of idea has also been used by Billy Clark and Jeff Lindsay, who used to teach uh, on this course. And Billy Clark actually has written a recent paper in 2007 offering a kind of pragmatic-based account of intonation. Um, the two things I want to just close with is that actually there are two other considerations that aren't really addressed in the literature at all. And they are these. And in fact, these are issues that, that are um, quite new, quite exciting, and tell me what you think. The first one is that even people like Bollinger, who view intonation as some kind of natural uh, phenomena, regard it as a coded phenomenon. So it's a kind of natural or a biological code. And Carlos Hussenhoven sees his, uh, even those views of natural meaning that he takes, even those views of intonation he takes to be natural, he regards them as codes. So the first one is this. It doesn't follow from the fact that something signals something that it's coded. It really doesn't. Something can be natural and not coded. And the distinction between what's coded and what's interpreted by inference is a very complex one as well. But it doesn't follow that it's coded. The second uh, issue, which is um, also interesting, is that even if something is coded, and even if something is language-specific or culture-specific, it doesn't follow that it's linguistically coded. So you can have codes that are not linguistic codes. And it might be that some intonation contours that stabilize between languages, between cultures, within cultures, within languages, are codes, but not necessarily part of language. So, as I said, that's, um, that's where it all starts getting quite complex. The picture is not an easy, not a convenient one. But, as I said, if it doesn't provide you with any example, uh, any answers, it does allow us to sort of approach intonation in a new way and perhaps ask, new questions. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end. Thank you very much.